are from the same um, yeah from the same source. Yes, so uh, they they were uh, those cases were few, but they were related to this. Uh, my comments that uh, it's the client, or the caller who should be responsible for threading. Uh, because there are some places, some actions currently are being executed, uh, well, triggered by the UI, and UI now knows what thread it, it is on, and it doesn't care about making sure that when the callback is executed, then it should. Uh, uh, regarding the threading, I mean, that would be really a problem when we introduce uh, uh, multiple threads. <coughs> In, in the main application and a little bit of uh, background because I'm not sure if uh, everybody has the same picture here. Um, uh, the, yeah, there's this user thread and maybe that's not a very good name and I should have called it application thread <coughs> because uh, when you run test uh, headlessly like uh, the seat node or so, it's just a single thread. It's not the application, the Java fix thread. Uh, <coughs> and when you start the desktop application, then it's the Java fix thread. <coughs> And our, yeah, ninety percent of the application is running on this user thread because we don't have usually performance issues. So only those areas where which are more costly are delegated to uh, to other threads, like writing to disk or whatever or network stuff. <coughs> and uh, and when we map back, also when you would use when you have this model that you are using at the same time, the desktop application and the API, then this user thread, this main thread, will be the Java X thread. It cannot be the other way around because then uh, the desktop would not work. The, uh, the API don't care which uh, thread it is, it has not a dependency. Just the UI needs the Java X thread, otherwise uh, Java X is not working. <coughs> and uh, you don't need to start up uh, the API with their own, with a different thread. You can use the user thread and then you are again in the single threaded model and both when you get the message from the API, it gets into the core on the user thread, which is then the UI thread and you don't have any threading issues. <clears throat> and for me, it's really super important. I just had a week of hell with threading in the DAO code. And uh, it's, of course you can, you can deal, I mean, there are thousand applications with multi-threading, you can deal with it. It's just added a lot of complexity, a lot of risks. We get suddenly a completely new, uh, new problem field uh, from threading related problems, which are very hard to debug and so. <clears throat> and when it comes to really critical stuff, which was especially in the DAO, where uh, a consistency of, of everything is the most important, uh, I just want to get any additional um, complexity and risk when we can avoid it. And when the only reason is to maybe be a little bit faster, that's for me not strong enough reason. And especially at the current state where we are lacking on developer resources and we don't want to spend a half a year to get uh, the application or multi-threading uh, support or whatever and still don't have an API for just trading bots out. That's for me a completely non, as I would not support this at all. <clears throat> would just make life much more complicated and everything much more risky. <clears throat> so I don't see a problem when you run both. When you start up the API alone, okay, then you're in your normal thread and not the Java fix thread, and you just cannot later then start up the uh, desktop and kind of like uh, plug the desktop in. So at starting time, uh, you need to know if you want to use desktop or not, but I think that shouldn't be a big deal. <clears throat> I mean. Um, Mike, uh, can you answer the question if there have been many issues so far, uh, what you have observed when you were manipulating, uh, mm -hmm. like creating a new offer and you didn't get it display on the UI when you had both running? Well, was everything working like expected? Well, so, so I only to, to run it a brief period of time to be able to debug it. Uh, so in that period, there were some discrepancies and then I... Then I, then I kind of uh, fix them. But now we're mostly using integration tests to do the testing. So uh, we haven't run it a lot so lately, but so I mean, in the end, it looked quite stable and there wasn't anything really yeah. wrong with it. Uh, I assume there might be some issues because uh, it was just not expected that there somebody else is 
<coughs> is changing. I mean, there's still a lot of state held in the in the UI models, so in this user, in this uh, user classes models, and that's not reflected in the core. So when something in the core is changed, you might not see the, it reflected in the UI. Mm -hmm. uh, in a perfect world, all this uh, logic, which is now uh, shared with other uh, clients, uh, uh, has to move anyway to to core, and then this concern should be less critical and I'm just wondering if, if it's worse. I mean, <clears throat> probably the best approach, like Chris said, is to just make a big disclaimer, say, yeah, you can do this. It's just not well tested. Don't expect that everything works perfectly. It can be that you create an offer and you don't see it in your portfolio. You have to yeah. restart the, uh, the mm. desktop and then you, yeah. you're in sync again. Yeah, that, was, our, that was kind of the approach that we're going to take as well for, for this release. I think uh, I think so. The talk about it's, it's very affecting is for once we do the API release, it's when it works. Yeah, maybe then we can have a look at what we can improve to make the API a less a la, so, so less heavy as a layer and to to make it just a, t a thin wrapper on top of uh, the BISC uh, core. I think that's the the main goal is not really to tell you why or anything, it's just so that we can have to less code in the API and just have it all in the core. Mm -hmm. I think that's the main goal. Of course, if we can improve the UI things in the meantime, why not? But, um, but by the way, I'm not 100% sure if the uh, REST calls. Uh, could reside on the same thread as the uh, on the user thread, uh, and the only problems that I had were that the listeners to events uh, were not, were assuming that the uh, that the caller will do this call on the on the user thread, and on, only if those listeners would wrap the handling with the user thread, that could. Uh, resolve everything. Uh, right, right now, in some places, it is the caller that that is uh, wrapping the call uh, to all the listeners with, with a user thread. And if we would be done, the but it's not everywhere. So if the approach would be like <laughs> different way around, then every listener that knows that they need Java effect thread, then they have to wrap the uh, handle the event inside of that. That's right. Uh, <clears throat> where, where do you have the use case? I mean, when you are <clears throat> listening, for instance, for new messages on the peer-to-peer -peer network, <clears throat> uh, one thing is you don't, you're not interested in this thread because those are multiple uh, connection threads and you don't want to touch those of, at all. So you, you want to map it anyway. Just a question if you want to map it to the user thread or to your special thread. But I'm wondering why you need another special thread and why you not having the business logic, which is already in the in the core probably, uh, in the user thread and uh, the threading. What what you need for whatever for the HTTP API stuff for so that can happen in, in their own threading also. Just when it's uh, communicating with the with the core. I mean, maybe I need to see a little bit more closely the use case uh, where you have this issue. I mean, a main reason why I didn't do it the other way around, also the model is a little bit um, taking over from Bitcoin J and Bitcoin J, uh, they're doing similar stuff that they're, that you can configure <coughs> um, that you are, you get mapped automatically to user thread. <clears throat> and the main issue is that uh, there is nearly, as it's completely exceptional that you don't want, uh, I think I don't have, I don't remember any case where I have it, where I don't want to get to the uh, map to the user thread. And when you would forget the mapping, which happens sometimes uh, uh, during development that I forget to, especially with error handlers or so, then smaller stuff or so, I didn't care. And and then, yeah, you get, you get runtime exceptions when uh, the UI thread is uh, closed. Well, from Especially uh, the pop-ups. Uh, for example, your offer yeah, has been that, that, Sorry, that has to be refactored anyway. So everything which is so graphical and which shouldn't be, or that, that has to be in, in the desktop only, as like I did already in some parts uh, with the application refactoring the startup. 
I mean, that's, that's completely clear. That's another topic for me. Uh, but that doesn't mean, I mean, just think, not think uh, as a user thread, as a UI thread. Think at this as the main, the main thread for the application. It's just a thread that it's, uh, that it's the Java fix application thread when you run the UI. Yeah, that's a detail. But for you, actually, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's just the important thing is that there's only one main thread for the for the most parts of the application because that then you can then you know everything is running synchronously and you can you don't have all the threading issues with yeah you know don't need to introduce a, a, a threading model with locks and whatever <coughs> and um, I mean what's your use case uh, where you need to map to your own custom thread which is not the main thread. I mean, this with the pop-ups, that, as I said, that has to be reflected that, or <clears throat> that you don't get anything uh, called on, 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 the, on the thread, which is the, or on code, which, which lives in the desktop. <coughs> as the API always have to be able to start, of course, without the desktop and everything works when, I mean, this, you, this main thread, when you start the API alone, is just a naked thread that's uh, a single, single thread. That has nothing to do with JavaFX, of course. Mm -hmm. Only when you start uh, the, at the desktop, then it's a JavaFX thread. But, uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh, when I was uh, starting the API, and, uh, well, in this, when I proposed that modular approach, uh, so um, the call to start the JavaFX application, that call blocked the thread. So if the API was starting after, uh, was, if it was supposed to start after, the, then it was never starting because the JavaFX blocked the thread completely until the application was closed. Um, when, when you only started the API without, uh, without the desktop? Or... No, when I was starting both desktop and uh, API and uh, first I called uh, JavaFX to start the application and then uh, was uh, yeah, another call was supposed to happen to start the API then the second call was never a call because starting yeah. the job was blocking <laughs> the thread. <laughs> I think you need to start your API stuff then when the JavaFX thread is created because there's first this this uh, main start thread, which is then creating the Java fix thread, and this main uh, thread is then probably in a, uh, uh, sleeping, and uh, you cannot use this first thread to start the API. You have, yeah, I mean, this startup process has to be done a little bit different, but um, I think that's all, uh, yeah, that can be all solved. <coughs> I mean, do you, do you understand or do you under, I agree uh, that we don't want to get in a multi-threaded uh, yeah, application? I understand. That's fine for me. Yeah. That's fine for me because the single user approach that Chris uh, mentioned, yeah, that's fine. And we should always assume that uh, this instance will be accessed. Even if I'm holding mobile and sitting in front of my laptop, I should be aware that I'm controlling this only through one device at a time. I should not yeah. be trying to tweak it concurrently. Yeah. And <clears throat> I mean, the only, yeah, I mean, those are technical engineering issues, but from my point of view, what you just said that uh, during the startup you get blocked because I think then you, you were doing it in the wrong way that you're starting it uh, before the Java fix uh, the application thread has started, and this uh, this you uh, so this user thread has started, and this user thread when you would start your API without the Java fix, then the user thread will be this single thread and it will work as well. It just uh, have to be uh, implemented in the right way, but I don't see a problem there. <coughs> um, and something what was mentioned a little bit before uh, a question from you, Bernal, where. <clears throat> I earlier I always uh, said and had uh, in mind that it's or I said before also that uh, separate applications that the the API would run as their own application. Of course, uh, with this discussion now, that's not really uh, valid anymore. 
and probably I have not thought uh, enough about this. So probably, yeah, it, uh, it's required that the API is uh, just uh, kind of like another access to core and that you, you can uh, enable the API by, by a command line flag. <coughs> And then, um, yeah, <coughs> uh, you are accessing the same application core, uh, like from the desktop, and it would start up with the with the desktop uh, at the same time. So that's a little bit a different view, like I had before, and uh, yeah, probably it cannot be done differently when we want to support this model, which makes sense because, of course, the other model to have it completely separate is a little bit limiting, too too limiting, and. I think this constraint what we have that uh, the desktop was not really tested and designed with that in mind that there are now another interface to manipulate the data <coughs> and might not reflect everything correctly. I think that's a disclaimer what we can just tell the users who are doing this. It's not the main use case and over time we can improve this and fix this. That's not a, not a basic problem. It's just engineering effort and the other design decision that uh, there is an and, um, yeah I don't know yet but uh, yeah, probably I, it has I, to be I missed um, I missed about 10 seconds you said the other design decision can you pick up that uh, yeah I missed design decision I mean that <clears throat> before I had in mind that the API is living as their own application and it's kind of like <coughs> outside of core and is parallel with their desktop. But of course it makes sense to have uh, one application which is accessible over the UI and over the API. <coughs> and I think then uh, the API core need to be probably part of core or at least uh, be part of the, uh, of the main application at the, the uh, desktop would would uh, probably has this as well in the in the code pass in the class pass <clears throat> okay so uh what are the steps uh from now because what what i see is that uh We've got this custom approach of starting this uh, API and uh, or API together with the UI. I think it's fine for the first release, but then uh, I don't know how soon would you like to start working on integrating the I don't know the API or at least refactoring the core. I think the core needs to be refactored uh, to to work in like a stateless manner. Then we could add the gRPC and then uh, API on top of gRPC. Yeah, I don't have strong opinions how you should do it. <coughs> uh, just a small note on this refactoring of the startup, what I did for the BISC application, I think that's more or less kind of okay <coughs> now. Uh, what's still missing is the main view model, uh, but the side note, I mean, I was warning <laughs> a lot and at the end I did myself at least two uh, bug, uh, introduced two bugs in, in this uh, refactoring, which I tried to make a pure technical refactoring, refactoring but of course at the end it's, uh, it always uh, is more like, like just moving code from one class to another class. <clears throat> And uh, it just has shown to myself how tricky it is and how uh, dangerous area it is. So uh, with that, I want to emphasize to make it in small steps and not make a huge, completely different approach because then you have to test for half a year, or not half a year, but it's just much, much more risky. <coughs> uh, and as just a note, I mean, there were one thing was with the bouncy castle that it was not... Uh, or oh no, sorry, the cryptographic restrictions were not removed at the right moment, uh, was done one step too late. <coughs> and I locally have uh, still my own old setup where I have this all in the JDK manipulated, so I didn't see it. And the second, which I just discovered the other day now, was uh, <coughs> when their database files are corrupted because of protobuffer changes or whatever, <coughs> uh, you get a pop-up with 
the affected files and they get kind of like backup this corrupted corrupted files <coughs> and uh yeah the handler for this is the ui <coughs> and that was also broken and uh, the handler was not cold because it was done before the, uh, the application has started and so on. I just uh, changed this also <coughs> and made a pull request the other day. So, and those are, yeah, those are cases which doesn't happen often. You are, it's, it's hard to test all those cases and there are many more like this exceptional cases, uh, like with Tor, with the, <coughs> with the, <coughs> where when you don't get the Tor connection, when you do SPV resync. All this, it's boring to test this because they're a little bit cumbersome to to set up the test for doing, for replicating these issues and so on. So just as a warning, it's dangerous areas. Um, when we change this really as small as possible, the steps and not in one go, you cannot change this uh, yeah, with, one <coughs> with one big uh, change and expect that everything, I mean, you can do it of course, but it's much, much more risky and much, much more, work for myself to review is and i i will not have time at the end to to do this <clears throat> so the only stuff what i would expect as review and as, as maintainer would be small refactoring steps which will not be perfect at the beginning but after a few iterations it will get to a point where it's usable uh, for headless and <clears throat> Um, I mean, headless. It's work. It works already for the seed nodes. It's just the seed nodes and the, the other headless nodes are not are uh, using all, uh, all the features. They're only using a subset, also mainly the peer-to-peer -peer network. <coughs> but the same model, like it's done there, can be applied for a full features uh, version. And basically, when I would continue, I will not do it because I lost already a lot of time and I regretted it at the end that I did it. Uh, when I would do it in main view model, I would just start uh, one step after the other, move this cryptographic restriction check to a whatever, something in core, then the next step, move that out, then in the, yeah, do it that way. And uh, and I think it's it's not really too difficult. It just, you have to be super careful to not break anything. <clears throat> the sequence of the stuff is really important. <clears throat> and there is some inherent complexity in this startup because we yeah, we are supporting quite a lot of different um, situations and there's also quite a lot of optimization. For instance, with Tor, we don't want to wait until uh, when Tor is uh, used and uh, not used for the Bitcoin part. We don't want to wait until Tor is ready. You can start Bitcoin already immediately and such stuff. So um, yeah, anyway, talked already too much about this. Uh, also, my my suggestion basically is just that the current model is kind of like a little bit dangerous because you are not probably synced with master and it's going on a lot in master. And especially uh, with the new feature, for instance, for the edit table offer, yeah, you have to kind of like, I don't know how you deal with this to copy over or merge it in. <clears throat> but at some point, and especially when the DAO is ready, hopefully in maybe two months, uh, that it will be a big change for many areas. So I think it's not a good future-proof uh, situation at the moment. So probably the earlier you you get uh, to a, to a, a proper model where you are using uh, the the core and we are doing these refactorings, the better it is. And I assume it's not really. I mean, the startup stuff. Yeah, I think it's it can be done in a few days. So it's not really so big problem. Well, maybe, but I've tried that. I've I've spent two weeks on this. I've yeah, but you did. Me. I think you you did a too. You tried to do too much to uh, to design a new architecture about the startup and with this plugin idea and so on. Or uh, I mean, that would have been nice. Yeah, when we would have done it in the very early days and so. That was the natural. Uh, it's not that I thought. Oh, let's do it this way, and I was doing everything to force this. That was like the natural way that it popped up uh, or evolved. Uh, but because when you've got those different uh, uh, flags that you can start the same application with, so you can start it with only desktop, only API, uh, only RPC API, uh, or any combination of those, then that's where and I don't think this is going to be really trivial to cover that all those uh, scenarios. And I think from this conversation, this is where we're heading. 
Uh, so that, that's why I don't think that like small refactoring is going to work. Uh, and <laughs> if you don't have time, if we don't have resources right now for this, I think that we should go with the, the approach that we are just releasing the uh, standalone headless version and uh, we've got this yeah. code duplication where you can, uh, it's like, if you want to look at this graphically, okay, then, then it's fine, but yeah. best it's but do it in terms. Disable, I'll stop your API, start your <coughs> BISC uh, yeah. client. I'll and I, I would do it for like this for the next two or three months until we would have time for bigger refactoring of the startup. Yeah. Uh, one question: uh, How you are doing at the moment? Or uh, yeah, up uh, syncing with with master, for instance, like with the edit offer, or when the DAO get merged in? Uh, how you dealing with this? What's the process? How you do it? Well, we just depend on the core. Uh, so we just uh, update the uh, tag in the dependencies, and that's it. Uh, not much ha uh, has changed in the previous. Uh, in already existing uh, uh, functionality. So you are you are reusing the same uh, <coughs> source code. What we are uh, so you you are you are using the the Chaffle from Master mm -hmm. or Core? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, not Master. We we are using some um, particular commits, but. Uh, uh, we, when we did that refactoring of the startup, that's what we already uh, uh, use. Uh, so we're not like using the 067 version, we use yeah, okay. a pretty recent one. Maybe not the most recent, uh, but very recent. Yeah. But basically the areas where you have your changes are kind of like is more or less isolated and you can merge 99% of the changes from master without big problems yes right okay yeah then i don't but, see but just to be clear it's not you're not merging changes from from this no, core master not. you're picking up a new commit you're just sitting on top of a new version of the artifact that's this right. core right okay and so so the, the given the the current approach right you know you have you have this API, which contains you know, all the stuff of Swagger and everything that it takes to accept and handle HTTP requests and so on. You're ultimately routing those programmatically through this core APIs. Um, I'm just sort of stating the obvious, but again, just so we're all on the same page, right? Which is well, well yes, but uh, um, we also <laughs> have both applications, so it's not like that we use exactly the same logic. For example, uh, where we, when we need to call a BTC wallet service, then then we we do this call. But uh, the, in the um, desktop version, there is lots of business logic inside the view, so uh, we have to we had to copy yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So, um, but yeah. So, uh, thanks for saying that. And just to, to sort of finish my statement of the obvious, right? Um, just the, the current arrangement it, um, totally necessitates that there's two processes. It's it's impossible to have one process. This desktop that includes the API, just by the nature of the thing, right? Like you have to have the API running and or have the desktop running, right? So that is a case where we have two processes m manipulating the same, potentially the same data directory, right? Yeah, you're on mute if you have Well, right now we have, uh, you can run it uh, only headlessly or you can mm -hmm. run it together, but this is our custom Startup thingy that we also did uh, lots of copy paste. Uh, um, how does it how does it work to have a to have a unified like to have a a, a, a graphical disk with the API in the mix? Like how are, how is that happening? 
Well, we we also use the um, the uh, desktop. Uh, like, oh, like depending on the desktop. Yes, jar, but or okay. the, the, mm, the main class uh, that is starting needs to do some special ordering or mm. to start API in in proper place. Mm. And right now there is no way for us to plug easily uh, the API into, mm -hmm. for example, the the, the Mm, bisque main from the desktop so we had to copy paste that part mm -hmm. okay okay so i want to throw an idea out there don't don't know if this will go anywhere but let's let's just see right um what if um i mean you you, you, you could ship a an a V101 you know, or 10 of this as is and get, start getting validation as quickly as possible. So, you know, don't let this idea necessarily torpedo that. Um, but what about if we, as basically as quickly as you like, um, integrate, integrate BISC API, HTTP API into core. Um, including including whatever workarounds you've done, right? You know, sort of extracting business logic from from the UI layer, or putting it into your own this proxy, or kind of whatever whatever um, kind of duct tape and bubblegum services you put together to do it. Right? It might be code duplication, whatever. It's all fine. But what if we what if we do integrated because ultimately ultimately it has to be integrated right if we're going to get a single process that can do both things um and just and, and just really have a firewall around that around that code right so that so that you know basically at, at, the, at the initial integration right like how would we know that we were done with this step you know we ship whatever BISC 071, not 070, but the next one, let's say, you know, this 071 grows a new, sorry, it's very loud in here. Can you guys hear me okay? You can still hear me? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah okay. okay. Yeah, um, but let's say, let's say 071 learns a new command line option, right, dash dash HTTP API. Uh, and when present, uh, that uh, you know that starts listening on on port eighty eighty or whatever you're whatever you're doing there uh, to accept to accept in, incoming HTTP requests, um, and and that's and that's it, right? So like you 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 introduce just the absolute minimum set of code that is obviously you know handling and routing HTTP requests, running them through your own possibly full of duplication uh, service layers or whatever. And ultimately, you know, talking to the, manipulating the same data that the, the desktop is, uh, just, just a total best effort kind of um, situation where you don't, basically we don't refactor anything. We just take what you've built, get it in there, uh, call that 071 or 072 whenever we whenever we get this done, um, and it's from there that we then take very incremental, very stepwise. Let's you know, let's remove that duplication. Let's get that business logic out of the UI. Let's remove our own uh, kind of. Um, 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 service that we built or whatever that contained the duplicated code, get it into the right form. Everybody uses the same thing, but then we can just step by step by step and we can figure out when in that process to, to actually plug in gRPC, right? Which might be sooner, it might be later. We can, we can figure that as we go, but, but you know, the more we talk about this, the more it seems to me we, I, I, I don't want us having this parallel world where, where you guys have, you know, we, and here, sorry, here's the other thing. Um, there's, there's a, uh, 
um, yeah, forgive me while I just collect my thoughts here. So, so the other thing that this is assuming is, uh, and this is a change, right? Is that this, this very initial release as part of, you know, BISC proper, uh, it, it's not, it's not so easy to run headlessly. Uh, but, um, or, or, or we don't focus on that. Uh, it can come, and it can come just as fast as we can get there. But the assumption with this very initial release is that is that you run this just like you always did, just like you downloaded 067 and you run it like a GUI. You download 071 that now grew an HTTP API, and you run it like a GUI. Uh, and if you want to access that HTTP API remotely, then here are the steps. Do this, you know, Dyn DNS. Do this. Uh, uh, let's encrypt, whatever. And 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 this is where it, like it's actually like very much the order of operations that I want, which is which is that we we always do basically the, we always do the right thing first, which is this grows a new feature. It doesn't have to leave your computer, right? And, and, and we give first class instructions about how to do this. Now, it might be that not very many people do it because it's just inherently cumbersome to set up a cert certificate to do dynamic DNS, whatever, but it sends the right signal. It, for those who care, which is our core audience, right? They, 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 they continue to get the, a non-confusing message from us. Right, the, the sort of integrity of what we're doing, the brand is like crystal clear. This is about you know private censorship resistance, all that stuff, right? So we give them first class instructions on how to do it, and we let them know, look, we're gonna have instructions for how to deploy this on AWS and all that stuff down the road. We got refactoring to do, but we just take it step by step in the sort of correct order of operations, uh, and it gets you integrated into into this proper just as quickly as possible uh, i had when initially when i uh, mike uh, wanted that uh, yeah we're adding this uh, this classes uh, <coughs> into the startup that we can uh, plug in uh, the api uh, by command line argument i don't remember exactly the details but i had some concerns regarding security so that by when you have by default or those extra parts and you run this uh, this desktop that you might have more risk like in the current situation and that was one reason why I didn't want to mix it Mike uh, can you explain a little bit how how this uh, plugging in of the of the API infrastructure and of this proxy is, is done at the startup just before you do let's um, we got to recycle the, the, okay. the video so I'll paste another URL <clears throat> Okay, guys, we're, we're recording again. By the way, I have to drop off in half an hour. I have another call with, uh, with uh, okay. Florian, the peer to peer network guy. Sure. And I have to drop off in five minutes because I have another call. Oh, okay. So. Yeah, let's try. I mean, <coughs> well, uh, as yeah. far as I remember, so the idea was also to have a command line switch. So, in case that you don't also activate the API, the the code of the API isn't executed, so I don't think there's a lot of also extra so risk there. In case if you do activate it, then yeah, it just starts a Jetty web server with yeah with which which exposes the APIs. Uh, I think. Uh, but wasn't there uh, um, something extra where? <coughs> Where it kind of, um, yeah the calls were delegated. I don't remember exactly, but there was something a little bit which we're using um, maybe uh, um, no uh, no I missed the word now. <laughs> Wasn't there something more dynamic where uh, yeah which was based on reflection? Wasn't there some tool which were? Uh, it's it's possible it uses some tool which uses for reflection, but uh, it's not in the it's not in the API code. But we depend on the Chux RPC and uh, and drop it. This, this proxy, uh, I remember there was some 
<clears throat> some class which get everything and we're kind of like delegating it and or something like this? Uh, I, I don't think that's in there. I don't know if it was whoever in there, but at the moment it's, it's certainly not doing any reflection. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Just want to be sure that yeah, that we are uh, not introducing any risks when, uh, even if it's protected by a command line argument, but when there would be some way how you could over the network, whatever, get into the application. I mean, we have always have to consider such a aspect because it's money at the end. It's mm -hmm. a wallet. And <clears throat> another completely different topic besides all the technical is, have you uh, thought about how we deal and especially with you, Chris, interesting to discuss uh, with arbitration cases when there are then users of the API, they get bugs, they get problems. And then, I mean, it's a little bit of um, conceptually question how we deal with this when basically secondary application be beside the main application, which is a desktop, are using BISC and creating problems. Uh, do we first arbitrate this to learn all this? It can be in future, it can be third party or applications who are using centralized services and uh, piggybacking on BISC, and we don't want to provide arbitration for them. So it's a kind of like a, we're getting in a, into, a, um, uh, into a blurry area. How would it be with API? Well, I, I've also thought about it since the discussion with, uh, with Bernard and Chris, and yeah, I think there are two parts to it. First of all, is it, it it should be clear from the dispute that it comes from a UI, uh, from the mobile app, so that so in the beginning, uh, that you see, okay, it comes from the Azure mobile. Maybe it's just a bug in the in the Azure mobile, because so I mean as I said. So I mean, as a, so as a second step, we can't really hold it. We can't really hold it back. I mean, once the API is out, some guy can just so add the dispute call, and it's it's also there is. So you have to find a way to 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 deal with it before someone else does the implementation. But those are my uh, quick thoughts on it. Um, if you guys don't mind, I'd like to defer that question. We did start talking about it the other day um, uh, in, a, in, an, in an issue, but since since people have to go, um, I'd just like to see if we can put a put a you know kind of come to some sort of consensus on what we were just talking about. Like this 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 basically introduced the most minimal cut of the API possible, including whatever workarounds are there right now, and then refactor as we go, possibly including introducing GRPC, all of that kind of stuff, like that, just that spiel that I did before the before we recycled the video. Did, um, were any red flags there, anything that that I missed? I mean, what, what, do, we, what do we think? <clears throat> Well, maybe Bernard can answer that because I think, uh, I mean, it's not a bad idea, but of course, if we remove the, the headless functionality, then the mobile doesn't work anymore. So maybe it would be good to do a release so of the API but as it, it is. But it does, right? It, it, if, yeah. if we introduce this constraint that you have to talk to it locally. Right mm -hmm. um, in this very first release, and then we'll get there with with, with headlessness. Um, actually, it, to, to me, it, it kills a bunch of birds with one stone. I, I would actually be happier with that order of operations. But go, go ahead, Bernard, if you want to address that. Well, so basically, with this approach, we only lose the uh, part where we host the BISC on servers, but. Um, if it's, uh, I think right now it's used mostly locally on desktops, so that should be fine. We just, uh, well, remove the option from the mobile to deploy to AWS for, for some time until we've got the headless version, and I think we should be fine. Uh, how much uh, code, how many classes are would would be added to core and? Uh, what, what they are doing, I'm, I'm, yeah, I have not looked uh, since long time into the API stuff, just to get a little bit of better picture what the changes would be. 
Mike? Well, I think there's a lot of classes. So we've got uh, many classes as the model uh, to represent the data that go in and out um, through the API. We've got about eight resource classes uh, and each contains several endpoints. And there is this one big fat uh, BISC proxy that holds the, wraps the logic and does some code duplication there. And, and there is a different start, <coughs> startup class for, I mean, that would be then a part of desktop because. Uh, yes. And this startup class is more or less in sync with the latest changes on master or but what, can, can you can you define what you mean by startup class because if the if the if the main if the main method path is this desktop's main method and nothing else in this initial cut like what's the startup that we're talking about here okay so i have to leave we'll uh okay Bye -bye. Yeah, yeah, sure. Bye. Thanks. And this will, this will be recorded, but we'll, we'll yeah. wrap up as we can too. Thanks. As far as I understood, uh, uh, they are using uh, the, yeah, the, the main class where everything is starting, or at least under the BISC application. So they used some hook where they hooked in their proxy and their API stuff, and probably some other changes in, in the startup, or, but then I can for sure answer this better. Yes, yeah, so it's... Uh, Maybe not 100% in sync, but it follows the uh, most recent uh, approach. So I think it should be very easy. It's basically probably two, two calls that we need to squeeze into the BISC main in appropriate place. So it should be easy. Yeah, that's, that, like, that's, what, I'm, that's what I'm hoping for in my mind, right? Is it we add, you know, uh, basically a new package, HTTP, something like that, it has however many classes it needs to have. And there's ideally one line that gets added to ex BISC's existing bootstrap logic that, you know, lights all that stuff up or not, depending on whether the, the option has been provided, right? So it's just, we're just, you know, just basically, yeah. Exactly as I just described it. Yeah, maybe there's two calls or whatever it takes, right? But um, yeah. I just want to make sure I don't have some completely off, you know, mental model about how we could basically introduce introduce this in a rather unintrusive way, and where it's really cordoned off, really firewalled, and then we just systematically piece by piece by piece, one pull request at a time, turn it into the situation that we want and need it to be. I um, also would prefer to have it in a separate project, basically, and only the very minimal in desktop or in core, which is then accessing. And of course, desktop would then use this project. There uh, will be an additional dependency uh, yeah. because uh, I think there, and th that was for me the main reason why I was rejecting it. In initially, I thought uh, yeah, desktop doesn't know about the API and is not interested. Why there should be a dependency? So it should be the other way around that there should be an API application which is using desktop. And well, that's oh, in this case, an here. API library, right? Because there's there's really no case, like based on everything that we talked about so far, um, there's you you could you could run this in a headless API only mode. So in that sense, there's an application, right? But there's it, so uh, let me kind of back up because you said that have it in a separate project, right? And and actually that's that's been my intention all along as well. Um, fundamentally, because I, I I haven't seen or I don't see or I haven't seen uh, an HTTP API as really core to BISC. I'm not like against seeing it that way. But um, what I definitely see as core to this is an RPC API. And then there are some use cases for HTTP, but the RPC is the, is the base truly core thing that's like deeply integrated uh, in, into core. Uh, so I've been seeing it that way, and that's why I've kind of, you know, advised and suggested, like, let's keep this separate and so on. Um, but what I'm thinking from a really just a, a much more pragmatic view at this point is, is is what if we do 
integrated now uh, have have the HTTP API in core uh, for the purpose of being able to tease this stuff apart in a in a in an incremental way, in a sane way, uh, where by the time we're done, it's like the end state of this should be that what's in that HTTP package that API package in core should be quite thin, right? Like certainly no business logic is getting reproduced, right? It's just what does it take to adapt an HTTP request into the correct, um, you know, this core API call. Uh, and, and at that point, it, well, it's quite a reasonable, you know, thing anyway, maybe it does belong in core, maybe it's fine to be in core. But, um, but what I'd really like to happen in that process is that the, the, the work of, of, of refactoring and teasing this stuff apart and getting business logic out of the UI and, and pushing stuff down into core where it should be and thinning out HTTP API in the process is that, is that what, we're, what we're really defining there is the shape of the services. And these are just like normal Java, POJO services, I mean, in that sense of the word. We're defining the services that desktop is gonna consume and that HTTP API is gonna, is gonna consume. And those Java services will, will basically be telling us a whole lot about what our gRPC services should look like, right? That's what we need to be able to expose. Um, desktop will always continue talking directly Java-wise, but it'll be talking to an underlying Java service that has a very similar shape as the G gRPC endpoint does. And so now at that point, so if you imagine we just kind of incrementally refactor gRPC services into place and so on, and HTTP API gets real thin and desktop gets thinner too because it's doing less business logic up there, then then you could you, you could at that point in, in theory separate out the HTTP API into its own project. I'm not sure it would make any sense at that point. Um, it might be just just fine to keep in to keep in core, and core has basically two APIs, RPC and HTTP. But the HTTP API talks through the RPC API, right? To 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 keep it um, to keep all of those things in sync, and, and we could extract it. We could just see how it goes. Um, um, yeah, maybe I'll pause it. I think that we can keep it also as a separate project as it is right now and just add the dependency from desktop to, uh, well, mm -hmm. yeah, probably from desktop to. Yeah, that, we, yeah we, we certainly uh, could. The, the only reason API that project yeah. uh, and uh, just modify the BISC main class to, uh, to, to start yeah. the API. Yeah, well, and that. And that I mean, yeah, I mean, and that would be the, the very, very least intrusive thing to do. And I, like, I've basically been for that approach the whole time. So, um, uh, so I'm totally with you. Uh, I'm just, I'm floating the idea of, of including it in core, uh, ba basically to avoid um, um, more cross repository um, um, PRs, right? Um, just just to make it as as efficient as possible to to refactor those those things, you know, atomically PR by PR. Um, I mean, we're, I think we're getting quite used to these multi repo PRs now, which isn't necessarily a virtue, but. Um, yeah, I, I'm, 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 I'm open to either one. I, 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 do like, I do like keeping it separate as well. So I'm just, just putting options on the table. Uh, Bernard, could you, uh, could you send me some pointers to the, to the main classes which would get added to the BISC repository as probably desktop, I think. <coughs> uh, so this startup uh, class for, for the main application or the, this main changes which I mean, uh, as far as understood, the, the main part of the API will be in their own project. Uh, and for me, it's not such a big difference if it's now in, uh, yeah, in Mike's or in your repository or if it's in this main repository, <coughs> its own project, but we would merge, or we would take over uh, these changes in the code for starting up the BISC. 
desktop app and that I would like to understand a little bit better about the changes and so on. And I, it's uh, yeah, nearly a year or so when Mike started on this when I've seen this and I uh, would like to get a, a good view of uh, what, what's really the changes there. Because, because you want to have a sense of like, what, you know, just what are we, what are we taking on board now when, when we spin up this? What, what extra are we doing? Yeah, yeah, that? yeah. Uh, I mean, I probably my concerns are I'm a little bit uh, <coughs> over concerned with with uh, security. But I remember I I was opposed in the in the very beginning against this uh, with some security feelings at least and at the end. And you know you have to be a little bit paranoid with the stuff like with Protobuf. We was not aware there were real uh, risks. And somebody could have theoretically taken over BISC and steal all the money of all the users. So that's just lost audio on that. Paranoid at the end because we're yeah. meeting with money. And when there is anything where we are not, uh, yeah, where some magic happens in the background from some third party libraries and we are starting up this magic by default, I would see this as a security risk and I would not like to have this by default. For API users, that's a different model because you can tell the people, yeah, when you're running your trading bot, you're getting into different security model. It's not their, their user who trusts us in a way that our software is safe and we are adding stuff, uh, yeah, what we, especially with third party libraries, which are doing heavy reflection. I mean, with Protobuffer, that was some stuff with reflection at the, the, at the constructor, at some uh, uh, Apache library classes, and that had some security risk where somebody could take over with a network message, could take over control and could execute foreign code uh, executables and could hijack your application and your computer at the end. That was very dangerous at the end. and. I uh, want just to emphasize that we take a lot of care about such stuff and uh, that's said in other places that's one of the reasons why I try to be very conservative with adding uh, adding uh, third party libraries and mm -hmm. especially fancy stuff uh, with reflection and cool magic stuff. Choose is already enough and uh, but yeah. Yeah. Um. I totally agree on all of that, um, but just to be clear, we wouldn't be running this by default in any case, right? This would be opt-in. Yeah, but, but it's in the class mess. It's a different. Uh, even if you have deactivated it by the by the command line, uh, you, you, we, it's compiled into their application. Mm. I mean, like a uh, wizard. But you're not even going to get static initializers if you don't class load stuff, right? And so, so yeah. It, so we have to be careful about how about how we integrate. It. But it should yeah, be, yeah. It should be it's, such that the best you know, would if be that if a code exactly. path never touches exactly if the code path never the class loads until right. exactly because that was for instance with this uh, uh, with this uh, protobuf issues <clears throat> when you would have such a vulnerable class in your class bus even if you don't use it in your code bus it would have been enough that the attacker could access it could trigger this class and use this as a proxy to get into to take over control so. When I see, yeah, that would be an important step here to when there is a possibility that we avoid that this uh, total library, this uh, API library, get included into the class bus when you are not starting up this with uh, with the flag, then I have very yeah, then I then we are much less uh, at risk. So, yeah, so the, just just want to make sure the distinction that I'm laying out is clear, right? So it it would this API library would definitely be on the class path, whether it's a separate project or not, right? Even if it's just a package within the main project, but it would definitely be on the class path. Uh, the question is whether any of those classes get class loaded. And if something else has the ability to class load, like to, to sort of execute the arbitrary code that can, that can class load something, then I I mean they've already got quite a lot of control right so yeah, yeah. Um, but may, maybe are uh, sure I mean it's uh, <clears throat> but maybe maybe there are some ways that are uh, I'm just thinking loud I have no idea if that's uh, mm -hmm. feasible to do <clears throat> but maybe to ship their BISC application with in two versions and depending mm -hmm. on their on the flag with what you are starting, you are starting the one which has a different class pass and uh, and or you start the other. So then the yeah, well, your desktop would be like now; it would not know about the API at all. Yeah, and 
the second application would start or right. well um, I'm not sure if that's feasible yeah that's well this, this actually gets back to you know um, Bernard's earlier um, proposals right I mean we could certainly have a, a kind of service provider interface style if there yeah. is an implementation of X X service provider interface on the class path then we class load that we serve or not we class load it but we service load it right so th this would be something like a disk extension uh spi right the, and and what that would allow is for us to ship disk and by, by the way this is this this might be something we want to do for a couple of reasons um it, so we can we can ship you know uh disk desktop the official certified good to go guaranteed whatever um you know disk like we do today and and people can be free to uh, put the 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 experimental or incubating incubating BISC HDP API jar on their class path, and if it is present, it will be service loaded, and and it'll be and it'll be bootstrapped. That's a, a total possibility. And again, this is you know close to what Bernard was su suggesting before. Very similar with the sort of idea of BISC extensions. Um, so that that goes a long way to like really indemnifying us in a way saying like really buyer beware and of course like part of that extension getting service loaded would be it contributing an option a flag right to the to the to the uh, command line saying like okay now you can pass dash dash http server and this this logic will will like actually kick in um, that's all possible we could do it all that way another reason that we might want to do it that way is um is for the for the future you know adversarial environment we're going to see around um, security tokens right so we could have the kind of um set of assets that disk ships that are the safe ones btc ltc whatever uh, and then anybody's free to run whatever constellation of assets they like so even possibly multiple jars um, people could just define their own jars, right? Yeah. And and then you, and but but it's just people are free to do whatever uh, they want to do, and we have no control. The problem with this because our <coughs> with this uh, plugin idea, mm. and our, I mean, just imagine somebody has a shitcoin and make a lot of marketing and say, hey, download this jar and add this to BISC and and you are great and so, and people are doing it and it's malware and it's totally. getting infected. And totally. then uh, people blame BISC. They, they, yeah, it, yeah. It, we are we are at the end the host, and we are uh, they yeah they they will put the responsibility on us. So that's why why I was opposed against this plugin idea yeah. in general because I think it's a dangerous task to open. I think we should only open it for very very few things like uh, yeah like now the API maybe in future something like a landing market or a coin join st stuff what we really have in control and where we say yeah. okay. That's safe. We are supporting this. Yeah. The problem. The problem is that you is that you can't have it both ways, right? If you open that door, then you, know, you say, "Oh, but yeah. it's only I, open I, I, for the API." Well, somebody can masquerade as the API and just have a bunch of mouth. I mean, right. I would see the distinction here that when people are, we cannot prevent it. It's all open source. People can do whatever they want. And when we are not adding shitcoin, and somebody release a bisque with shitcoin and call it bisque with shitcoin or whatever then uh, yeah, we cannot stop it <clears throat> and people can trade when they are using it. Just when they get then robbed by this shitcoin project and maintainer, yeah, they should not blame us and it should be uh, branded. That's uh, with the branding also for me, the boundary yeah. where I would not allow, I yeah, would not uh, allow basically our other people who are doing something differently, what we are not mm -hmm. supporting to brand mm -hmm. this business. They can brand it whatever they want. Just need to be clear yeah. to the uh, user that it's not BISC and not our responsibility then. Yeah, the, 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 but what I'm saying is that, is, that, is that you can't have it, nobody, everybody understands that you can fork and rebrand and call it BISC with shitcoin, right? Everybody understands that, I don't think that's what we're talking about. What I'm talking about is having a model where we say, look, there's this option that you have of downloading this like, you know, this optional module, right? The HTTP API or lending market or whatever it is. Uh, if you have a code path that says 
if this thing is on the class path, then we'll load it and and and, and light up the functionality. Then you're opening a big fat door to something just pretending to be that, right? So so so, so somebody can come along and say, here's you know. It's API, API binary, but it really isn't, right? It's it's some some you know uh, Trojan horse basically. The only way that we could avoid that is to have some sort of custom you know loading scenario that we say we're only going to load this if uh, you know if if the if the if the artifact in the class path matches this hash, right? You know has this checksum or or, or whatever. Um, which which we could do, but at that point we're already basically certifying the thing, and we have to be in total sync with it. Uh, every time they release something, we have to update this proper to know what the what yeah. the exact checksum is and all that stuff. And at that point, what are we really gaining? Yeah, so I tend to this model that are, that we, we are in control and we are limiting our reach in a way that we're not so open. With plugins because of the security reasons and and um, yeah and the other way when people want to do is and there's high demand they should fork when they're doing great stuff we will fork we will merge it <clears throat> and when when we are not convinced about this what they're doing they take all the responsibility and and another thing is with arbitration when there are new use cases or new fancy stuff and so suddenly we get the arbitration case and that's a big topic uh, which mm -hmm. is complex and I have not a clear answer how to deal with this when yeah. they are doing stuff which is not supported by us and people have problems it's not our arbitration cases they have to deal with it even if they are you just lost audience network yeah, yeah. We, arbitrators are not responsible for them but but I, I think I follow I mean well it's difficult I don't know how to deal with yeah, well, I, I, I mean, I think that in, in, in this case, right, in the case of, of APIs, you know, we're, I don't think we're going to grow 10 of these things. Um, I, I think, I think we, have, we have two that we've talked about, and I really don't see the use case for more. I mean, if, if, if I could have it, um, if, if I could have, if I could wave a magic wand, we would have exactly one. It would be an RPC API, and that would be all the world ever needed. The problem is, is that gRPC doesn't doesn't take you all the way to the browser, right? So, so you do need some HTTP, some HTTP in the mix at some point. So I can imagine an RPC API and an HTTP API that are that are ultimately core to disk, uh, and then everything else. If somebody wants to grow, I don't know, zero MQ or something like that, like they can do it, but they, but it's but I don't know, but it doesn't matter. It's like completely neither here nor there. So, so the question is, how do we grow the right HTTP and RPC APIs for BISC? And if our concern is that the HTTP API that exists right now is not ready for prime time, uh, that you know, and and we want to be like hyper conservative about it, I think that's perfectly fine, and that's exactly how we have been being uh, so far, right? We we haven't let anything inside the you know the firewall of, of of this proper and that's that's good that's very good that we're doing those sorts of things so i think what we can do is we can continue down that path and we can say like look it makes sense for if we're going to have such an api it makes sense for it to be really and truly properly core to disk so that people can really trust it so that it's really synced up um, so that there's uh, you know everything works together you have the same kind of things available by http as you have available by rpc uh, as you have available ultimately by the desktop and, and and those things are what you can do with a bisc instance is core to bisc so the the apis are core right but to get there uh, we can say, look, yeah, let's keep let's keep the API in a separate repository. Let's have the integration be, you know, yeah, the, that API is going to get on the class path of of core or of, of desktop of the whole application. There's going to be a kind of single method call and an option that that, that, that lights it up. But um, but we could not even ship this in 071 or 072. We could say it's basically. Um, you know, incumbent on on the on the mobile team, on the HTTP API team, et cetera, to get this into lean and mean shape 
and and the, and the burden of proof is is on you guys that that like and you know working with us it's not like adversarial or whatever but like you know we, we set the standard that says like this is like the most minimal HTTP integration we can possibly do with the fewest frameworks and all of that stuff and we really understand it and really trust it and until that time the 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 HTTP API team can can be shipping you know they can have their own fork we do have their own fork of, of desktop right they can say like look you can you know you can you can run from our from our fork right help us test this help us harden harden this and, and at some point in comes a PR that that you know everybody's really happy with and and we and we merge this thing and we, it, it, I mean we, we can get you know shipping shipping an initial release of this like it, it doesn't have to mean a a production release of this going along with 071 or whatever what it means is that it's announced in a way that it, that it turns all the right heads and asks for participation from all the right people and and we can help with that right whether it's twitter or you know or whatever like we can say and and and, and you guys can write you know very very clear you know read me some documentation and say like this is exactly how to use this api you know it's it, we're taking it step by step it's all very conservative and it means that you got to work from from this fork right I'm, I'm not saying this is what we should do but i'm saying because of the way we're structured we have all of these options right so we don't need to uh what we should not do is 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 come up with weird frankenstein architectural decisions to try to cordon off code that we that we are not comfortable with right what we should do is is if something should belongs in core then we should get that thing into shape to be in core however long it takes or whatever process it takes and we can do that through through forks and 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 keeping stuff in separate repositories and so on right Sorry, guys, I have to drop up <clears throat> just a very last comment. I mean, <clears throat> I'm not sure if that's a good idea, but one option would be also that they are adding, <clears throat> I think it's mainly the, the main class, which is different, that they are adding a second main class to a desktop. We are still using the, the original desktop for building the application and everything. People just can choose to start their, uh, the desktop with API support which has maybe some extra security risk, which are not 100% solved or investigated yet. <clears throat> and, uh, and then we are still getting it closer to the, I think one benefit to have it, everything uh, yeah, moved over to BISC is that we are getting more familiar with the stuff. Like I, yeah, I'm usually I'm not looking in, in the repositories of Ben or of, of, uh, Mike, but when it uh, becomes part of BISC, I'm more aware of what the use case, understand it better. And it probably makes sense at a certain point. And when we have it in a way a little bit firewalled, uh, then we are not adding much risk and uh, would be would be fine for me. But I leave this for you. I have to drop off now. And uh, yeah, um, but yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you, basically, Mark. with any any uh, decision in this direction, what we discussed, I um, just would not. Uh, I mean, when. When there is a consensus that you want to go much more in this kind of like open plugin architecture, I think we have to talk more because I'm not convinced that this is a good direction. But probably that was also not your uh, goal. I think I just uh, want to make clear that that would I would not support all the other discussion or di uh, uh, <clears throat> decisions. If we are moving it now to BIST yeah. or later, I'm I'm fine with any any version, and I basically find it not a bad idea to move it earlier and to get it a little bit uh, more integrated and, and on the way uh, do the necessary work to mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Manfred, to me the uh, modular, modular startup, uh, it's not to allow everybody to uh, create a plugin uh, because when you ship uh, BISC uh, nowadays, you merge everything into this one shaded jar and you sign it, sign the code. So when, uh, I think that it could be even done in a way that you, uh, we will not load anything that is not inside of this jar and is not certified, yeah. uh, right? Yeah, yeah, I understand. But, but the modular appro approach would uh, allow other contributors and uh, 
uh, potential future contributors to easier uh, create extensions. Yeah, but at, that's exactly the point. I, I'm not really, I think it, it creates a wrong signal. It creates a signal, hey, come on and develop some extensions to BISC. We don't want this because it's every time it's a huge burden on us. <clears throat> when any of this extension, and that can be very sophisticated, uh, we can overlook it and then, uh, yeah, uh, money gets stolen from BISC because of a third party extension. We are responsible at the end and it can kill the project. I'm not super, I mean, I only really see so far, of course, the APIs, but I, I would not see the API as an extension. I would see it also as part of the core at the end. An extension for me would be something like a, a landing mark. or a, a, a coin join. Then uh, uh, yeah, uh, incorporate it in a way that we are the owner of this will come up with our extension. I also don't know um, what might be possible extension for this, but I would, I mean, that with the, <coughs> with the altcoins, I think it's a very good example, but I think that uh, shows very much the danger. It would be then very easy for an attacker to give people the wrong char, uh, infected char, and people load BISC with this jar and get infected and get uh, rubbed uh, their Bitcoin. <coughs> and uh, yeah, as well also, I mean, uh, these altcoins, I think we should not take emphasis on them. I mean, they are, they are pointless. They are just 99% they're just for getting, or uh, it just can at the end. I mean, I would not really consider them as anything important for BISC. I totally agree. Um, Manfred, I know you got to go and we just have like, oh, yeah, I have to, I have to, yeah. so, so um, yeah, let's, let's drop off, but, but um, I'll just quickly, quickly say something with Bernard here. Yeah. So if you got to go, cheers. Thanks. Thanks for the call. Um, so Bernard, I think we really have like six, 60, 70 seconds here. Um, I prefer not to spin up another call. I bet you wouldn't either. <laughs> um, so uh, just, yeah, quickly, do you, do you, do you, do you, do you feel like you have next steps here? Sorry, I'm losing you. Uh, you're uh, breaking up. Chris, the audio was completely broken now. Oh no, how long ago? Whole thing? Oh. Uh, maybe you can uh, hide the video, maybe it's broken. <laughs> oh damn, how is this? We're gonna... Oh, it's much better. Oh uh, yeah, I was, I was just saying, uh, yeah, drop off Manfred and I'll try to wrap up with Bernard because we just have one minute. Um, but now we have like 30 seconds or so. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, so Bernard, let's just real quick come back and just, just talk next steps to make sure this is productive, this call, yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks, man, for the call. Thanks. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. Hey. Okay. We're recording again. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure that this is like, that we have clear clear next steps uh, walking away. So uh, maybe I'll just quickly say what, what makes sense to me, what I think is the takeaway, um, and then you can add to it or, or whatever. Um, I guess the thing that makes the most sense to me is at a, at a minimum, um, you guys have, uh, uh, you or Mike, one of you has a fork of, of, of this desktop that makes the one or two calls necessary to you know add the flag and, and bootstrap um, uh, the HTTP API logic, right? So there's like this super, super minimal potential PR to this desktop. Uh, and then I guess, again, the, the absolute smallest increment of change would be that you still have um, the, uh, uh, what's currently called BISC API, but I think it should be called the HTTP, BISC HTTP API or something like that that qualifies it. But in any case, uh, you have uh, an artifact, uh, just a jar that's produced from that. And um, and that would be the other change to, to this desktop is that it would depend on that artifact, right? That would become part of that PR. And then, um, and then you, yeah, you do, as as little as you possibly can in the HTTP API, um, but that but we know that that's still lots, right? Because you have this you know, duplication, refactoring of business logic and stuff like that. Um, that that would be the potential initial cut, and we could like take that 
we could take that PR and and that would be the cue, you know, for Manfred and myself or whatever to to really review from a security perspective and all that stuff, you know, what's in the API and what's it depending on and Jetty and all that stuff and see what see what we're comfortable with. I think that would be option one, and then option two would be a bigger, a bigger, or two, uh, two, two PRs, right? Where, where actually HTTP API gets really, you know, brought into core. But these are the these are the options on the table. I think, as as I see it from the call, what what do you see? First one that we have a, the API in separate project and just. Uh, create a pull request to desktop that would use uh, well it would depend on the API jar and the would basically launch it from the BISC main uh, based on the flag. I think that's the the more less invasive way and would allow us to keep the uh, code separate. Uh, I think that would be best for, for, for the start. And then the next step is to refactor the, the core um, to, to get rid of this BISC proxy. Yeah, so so okay, so, so let's call that option A, right? The, the least intrusive, most minimal set of changes. So, so we do that and then I'm kind of just repeating what you just said, I just wanna make sure I got, we're on the same page. Is it that we would then iterate on basically desktop and core and HTTP API to push down the right services. Uh, no, no, it's like um, uh, it, 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 you know, to push down the, the, the right services into the right places and to get rid of that code from both desktop and and uh, HTTP API, is that right? Yep, that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and so, yeah, so that's interesting. It's sort of in any case we're doing, yeah, you know, in any case we're gonna have multi-repo PRs uh, for, for each of those steps because there's minimally there would be desktop and core involved even if we brought HTTP API into core, right? So in this case, there would be these three-way PRs, um, but we're, we're quite used to that, aren't we? Um, yeah. Um, I'm just I'm just thinking now about um, uh, when would we when would we uh, introduce gRPC in that mix and I guess I mean we could just sort of see how it goes as we go but what I would because on one hand on one hand you could you could do it sort of integrated into every integration into in every iteration right into every pr you could kind of come along and say okay we extracted the right java service down into core and now we expose the right grpc service around it and that's what the http api talks to and of course that's what now any other client that wants to talk rpc can talk to and just everything's in lockstep or we could do a bunch of these iterations sort of get the services right and then come back and say like, okay, now let's do the sort of next phase of, of, of refactoring, which is where really we're gonna refactor HTTP API to talk to new gRPC services around those core Java services. And, and maybe that's, that's probably the right thing to do just so we're not doing too much at once, but um, just thinking out loud. But um, yeah, I mean, this all sounds quite good to me, the, the, the option A, the, minimally intrusive one and and uh and just go from there and that and that could be a yeah yeah well other other thoughts from your side mm, yes uh what would be your take on the api stability because once we start shipping it uh officially with this Mm -hmm. then people will write bots or whatever the integrations with the api and in if in course of the uh refactoring uh and introducing the grpc and we would uh, say for example d disagree on 
this data should not, not be returned by this endpoint or it should be structured differently. Um, and gRPC will not work like this. And basically, when we change the interface of the RESTful API, then the, um, people might get angry. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not sure what, how big the user base will be, and uh, we have to keep that in mind. That, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm very, very glad you asked. I, I do think about this quite a bit as well. Um, so I'll tell you what I want to, to do, <laughs> right? And reality as a way of um, uh, pushing back on you sometimes. But what I what I want to do is I want to take our view of that. Uh, oops, my my headphone just died. One second. Can you still hear me? Yes, I hear you all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you hear me again? Yes, I do. I hear you very well. Cool, thanks. Um, yeah, so, so here's what, I, what I'd like to do, is I'd like to really take our, our zero dot versioning seriously. Um, you're, you're familiar with semantic versioning? Yep. Yeah. So, you know, we haven't reached 1.0, and, and, and the, the, the semantics that we've had around 1.0, like in the kind of old roadmap document and so on, that's 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 been around achieving a certain set of um, milestones and functionality, right? And, and and the DAO coming online and so on. Um, of course, I I don't know how well you know that semantic versioning document, but there's like you know there's kind of an FAQ at the bottom that says like how do I know when to release 1.0, you know, to move from 0 dot to 1.0. And, and the answer is, I, I like the answer a lot. You know, the answer is, are people using your product in production? Then it's 1.0, right? Because you have to deal with the backward compatibility concerns of real production users. That's, you know, you can't just kind of say, oh, it's zero dot when in actual fact, everybody's treating it like, you know, production software. So. On, on, on one hand, I want to say, hey, this is, this is still essentially pre-release software two years later after actually being in production. It's kind of false, right? Um, but when it comes to these APIs and so on, like, I think we have to buy ourselves time. Um, I think we have to put out huge disclaimers and say, not just this might change, but this will change. Um, so you know, to the very small group, you're right, you know, what, how many people are gonna be using this? Well, at the very first release, no one, very, very, very few, right? Um, and we can communicate pretty clearly to that, you know, captive audience, like, hey, prepare for pain, right? Um, and indeed, give us feedback, you know, like it's gonna be, to a significant degree, your feedback that's, that's feeding into those changes. So you should be glad that there's gonna be breakages. But I think we should be ready to just change with impunity these, these APIs as they sort of, you know, meet the, meet the real world. And then we find out just, just how well or not well, you know, nobody ever gets this stuff right out of the gate. Everybody knows that. So, so I'm, uh, but, I think, but I think we should really explicitly advertise that um, and that it's going to be a, a few iterations, right? Yeah, not just getting HTTP API out there and letting some people kind of try it out and letting this mobile do what it needs to do around it, but but also that next big iteration of, you know, refactoring gRPC underneath it and finding out how to harmonize those things. And yeah, it's just, it's just going to change a lot. And I think that can all, maybe I'm totally you know, pie in the sky here, but I think that can all align more or less well with the with the 1.0 that we really should do around the, the launch of the of the DAO, um, of the, you know, sort of um, programmatic DAO. Um, I think I think basically when BSQ goes mainnet and trading lights up and so on, um, I think that's a good moment for us to to call 
disk 1.0, disk 1.0, because you know, it has been being used in production. It is being treated as a production app. We have huge backward compatibility concerns that we would not fuck with. So it really is in every way, uh, a, you know, kind of a one, one .x application, but we can signal that at the, at the, at the going live of BSQ. And at that time, uh, you know, sort of lock down our APIs and say, okay, future changes to these APIs will happen in a, in a, you know, in a sane and conservative and deprecation aware and versioned or whatever, you know, way we want to do it. Right. But between now and then, like basically for the next six months, I think, or, you know, at least the next three, um, it's just, just white hot chaos is what people should expect. Um, how does that sound to you? Yeah, that's fine. That's very, very fine. Just, we, it's just something that you, I wanted to bring up to your, Attention. Yeah, yeah. I think um, maybe um, I know we, we're just packing a ton in this call, and maybe this can be our, our thing to sign off with because it sounds like we have a, a plan here. Um, I'm very happy with. Um, but something I just haven't mentioned, I think, at all along the way, except very recently in this last, you know, proposal around definition of delivered and so on, is it. Uh, with with that with in, with everything we do going forward, um, but particularly with the API. I mean, I think the HTTP API. Sorry, Chris. I think I've lost you for like five ah. seconds. Oh, okay. Me, I'll kill my video. Is it? Am I okay now? Can you still hear me? You're you're muted. I hear you right now. Okay. Cool. Um, it, it, yeah, I just basically want to emphasize like. Um, what I have in mind around, you know, this idea of delivered uh, software when it comes to uh, the HTTP API, and I just, I, I, I found this. I so just long. heard emphasized, and the end there was. Oh no! Hang on, let me make sure my connection didn't go to shit here. Um, yeah, I don't know. Am I okay now? Now it's better. Okay, <laughs> fingers crossed. Let's see. Um, these guys, so I just want to just want to point out with regard to delivered software as it relates to the HTTP API that um, that I really like to see this this component like start to lead the way with you know or start to be like an example of of the the level of um, uh, just just you know quality in, in in delivering software that you know that I'm talking about in that proposal which is that I mean, it, 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 forgive me where I'm ignorant. Like, I mean, I know, you know, we've got Swagger and, and, and I think there's, you know, some, there's reasonable documentation of the endpoints and so on. But like the, the sort of next level here that, that like is the bar that I want, you know, everything to start to clear is, is that there's, there's a doc, right? Um, and I haven't talked a lot about this, this new docs website, you know, I've, plan to talk more about this but just to kind of let you let you in on what i have in mind here is it is that there should really be a doc right like you know using the bisque api or getting started with the bisque api or whatever it is we can talk about the, the format of it but it should be absolutely first class for people to understand how to interact with this thing and you know we talk about oh i hope somebody comes along and writes a trading bot like we should write a trading bot we should have the, you know, a, a reference implementation, it can be dumb as shit. It can just come along and, you know, add an, a new offer every time X condition happens or whatever. It doesn't, doesn't matter. But what matters is that we start like, like really delivering high class, first class software and documentation, right? And, and, and just sort of like putting something out there yeah. and, and like hoping people come along and consume it. We, we shouldn't be surprised at the results that we get when, when we do that. Like, so, so for, to, to clear this bar of, of the API getting into, you know, the, the, this network GitHub org and, 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 and becoming whatever, I hate this word official, but whatever we yeah, yeah, call yeah. that right in the future, it, it, it means these things too. Yeah. It's secure. Yeah. It, meets you know coding standards or whatever but it's also like it's it's not putting undue burden 
on the user to, to figure shit out, right? It's actually handing things on a silver platter. It's a pleasure to consume. It's like, you know, shit that you love to use. Um, and I don't think it's like a big ask. It's like just writing a doc. Um, but it, but it makes all the difference in the world. And then, you know, when it has that kind of interface to the world, when it's like properly documented in this really friendly way, then, then we can promote the shit out of it. Right. We can, we can light it up on Twitter and we can point people to it and we can get excited about it and so on. But, but if there's that gap, right. It's like, Oh, well now this has an API and there's some swagger documentation. Um, I can't really tell anybody anything. I'm basically, I'm telling people, go fuck yourself, right? Go read the code. Go, 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 go super low level, right? And so, like, forgive me if you guys have already sort of planned all of this, but, it, but it just, I, I want to say it all out loud because, like, this is the kind of, you know, s- standard I want to hit with this stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, go, go ahead. Uh, I understand it perfectly, and I think the best way would be to uh, just uh, describe how to achieve some high-level uh, use cases, like for example, how to conduct a trade, how to set up the currencies. It's not that much there, uh, so you we'll just, we'll just um, describe the use case and then exactly what requests you need to do describe the payloads that's fine exactly and and like with something like this to me it's just sample code right and something that 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 i can even if it's just one piece of sample code it, it, it goes such a long way i mean like as a as a developer i actually i like yeah so i'll read stuff but like what i really want is instructions that say clone this run this see shit work and then okay now i want to sort of go back and read the read between the lines read the further documentation read the whole you know end-to-end sort of prose that explains what's going on but you know just a just a, a samples directory and the api repository that exercises this shit that actually is a little a little bot that runs you, you know what i mean yeah, but we already do have the support directory where we've got the scripts to, uh, to even take the trade. Yeah, so okay. we're also setting up the, uh, it sets up the payment methods on both Bob and Alice, then mm. uh, generates Bitcoin, uh, then it generates, uh, well, yeah, there is also uh, so someone uh, submitting as arbitrator then those guys mm-hmm. are automatically choosing him and then mm-hmm. alice there is a request to uh create an offer uh if, get the address then there is uh, uh sending from the uh, bitcoin note to, to uh, alice or bob one of them and then the mm-hmm. other one is taking the, the offer. so we've got all that in the scripts in support directory okay we, okay yeah we're using it like on a daily basis for money uh, using it on a daily manual basis testing. for man for manual testing okay good yeah i have i haven't looked at all that stuff so i'll look at it but i just i wanted to i wanted to throw that in here in in this call like because I, I just haven't been saying it for a long time but like like this is the the standard that i want to hold stuff to is like every new component basically everything anybody does going forward is it like it has to stand on its own completely it, it, it can't it can't depend on um the core team or me or for god for, forbid the user having to figure shit out on their own like like shit just won't get accepted uh if it doesn't pass this bar of just presenting itself in a way to the user that like maximizes the chances of their success so like this, this is in no way a criticism of anything, right? I'm just, I'm just like, I just need to start being explicit about this before I start blindsiding people in their PRs and knacking everything, right? Because like, like we, we have to get to that level because uh, it's just nothing, nothing scales. We can write all the code in the world. And if people don't, um, don't have it on a, really on a silver platter, how to use it, then, then we're just telling them to go to hell, you know? People don't have any patience for this. You know what I mean? 
So, so, so documentation, discoverability, ease of use, it's just like extremely important. Um, yeah, I, I just want to put it all out. There's actually no action item around it. I mean, we can just take the next steps, but I just wanted to say it. Yeah, okay, okay. So apart from having the scripts in the directory with the source code, uh, we'll add some um, uh, tutorial uh, about how to... Uh, how to yeah, do yeah, exactly. Like, um, just super quick on that is, is that, so you've seen this new docs site, right? Um, uh, uh, yeah, you're muted, but I'm sure you have. So the, um, you know, that's basically the way that that's getting written right now is like, it's like almost totally unstructured um, because there's just no time to do like anything other than write the next doc that needs to be written. So it's all totally flat. Everything's, it, it, you can basically think of it as, as a kind of wiki that wants to become a manual over time. Right. So like really you can come along with just any doc that's useful, you know, uh, how to use the BISC HTTP API or something like that. Uh, as just a, you know, just, just the best first cut of something that you can do. And then it's there and at least there's something and that's what we can tweak links to. And that, you know, and then as things grow and get better and somebody comes along, reworks that documentation great right it can get better and better and better but but i wanted to create a place where um not in the projects themselves right because we have this multi-repo approach which is good for all sorts of reasons but one of the downsides is is that you can't discover anything so when it comes to documentation i want to put most of the documentation in that centralized place there's a line where, where stuff should still stay in the repos and we got to talk about what that line is over time. But when it's like, hey, users, something exists called the BISC API and hey, users, here's how to use it at a high level, you know, not like how to how to build the project or whatever, then then it just goes in that repo. So like the future um, kind of, uh, you know, a well-formed sort of correct PR, if you will, for, you know, adding new functionality of BISC or for sure adding a new component to BISC, like a whole new API is of course the code itself, but it's, but it's also a, a PR coming in the docs. It's, it's basically going to become an anti-pattern over time. If there's not a change to docs, if it's not in docs and you can't discover it, then it doesn't exist, right? Nobody knows that it, that it exists or you're somehow expecting somebody else to tell people that it exists. You're expecting somebody else to write the document. You're expecting somebody else to tweet links to it or whatever. And that, that just doesn't work. It just doesn't scale. So like nobody operates this way by default. No, nobody like wakes up in the morning and says like, Oh, I'm going to write docs, you know, but like, I, I, like I assert, this is the culture that we must have. We must have this highly autonomous, totally self-sufficient culture where if you, create new functionality you document it you promote it you tweet about it right or you take responsibility for working with whoever is doing the tweeting to have them do some tweeting but it's like a hundred percent on on you or on the team uh, to make all the right shit happen you don't you don't imply expectations on anybody else um, and and that and that needs to be so true that like that like um, basically contributions won't even be accepted if they don't have a, a, a minimum of documentation because they're, they're literally useless uh, if, if, if nobody can figure out how to use it, right? Or no, nobody knows it exists. Yep, okay, understood. Yeah, cool. Um, this is a super long call. Thank you. Um, yeah, just, 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 I just want to wrap up and just say like, thanks again for everything. Uh, you've been doing, Mike's been doing, uh, it, 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 it's awesome. I mean, this is coming together and it's all, there's, uh, you know, m mostly I feel like a total naysayer and, <laughs> and all that stuff. And I think that's all good actually in a way, but I just also want to say uh, thanks and keep going and um, thumbs up. Okay. Thank you very much and I uh, hope you will get better. See you later. Yeah, cheers, man. Okay.